previously on Detour Hotel. She wrote a final sentence in her notebook. I am an accumulation of ghosts. She tossed her items into her crossbody bag, swallowed the vitamin, and stood. Chapter 43 at 7.15 in the morning on April 7th, a variety of police officers, people performing community service, and Metro Nashville employees embarked upon a cleanup mission. Two white vans with chipped paint and yellow flashing lights pulled aside on Ellington Parkway, and eight low-risk offenders stepped out. They were followed by two police cars, a garbage truck, a bucket truck, and the fire chief. The vehicle circled up in the cool mist and the team assembled. This area's been a sore thumb for a long damn time, Corporal Vang said. He walked around the hood of his cruiser and shook Rowling's hand. Vang tossed a box of rubber gloves onto the hood. It's a place that didn't ask to be what it is, Rowling said. It got to be made this way. He turned and looked at the weedy vignette of arches, tracks, and paths that made up the Detour Hotel. Vang donned a pair of gloves and silently tore the perforated edge of the box of garbage bags. Sergeant Wells arrived in his cruiser and started lying cones along the shoulder of the road. One of the guys from transit took out a plastic bucket and mixed up a batch of industrial strength cleanser. Everyone made sure to slip on a reflective safety vest. Denizens of the nearby thickets stirred from their tents and peered reluctantly through the brush. Wells approached them and asked them for help. They weren't there to evict, just to clean up a bit. The haggard horde stood befuddled, donning gloves and lighting cigarettes. They watched the garbage truck compact its first load. Even with a scissor lift, the cleanup crew couldn't quite remove the top line of the marquee letters. It was 23 feet high and the letters weren't paint. They were a mysterious black rubber epoxy. How it had ever been applied in the first place remained a mystery. Corporal Vang suggested a theory. I have one of these pool toys where you dip a tube in the water, you pull the handle on a cylinder and it draws water up in there, then you can push it and blast somebody with it. You could easily paint that with one of these things. Maybe they got on each other's shoulders. Even then, that's 20 feet high, Wells said. They watched the bucket truck try to maneuver up under the cantilevers of the overpass. What does it say? Vang asked. Before hovel. Before hotel, no. Detour Hotel, Rawlings said. Detour Hotel, definitely, that makes sense, Wells said. He nodded and kicked a piece of concrete. Rawlings wasn't convinced. Nah, you know what? I know what this says. It's B-Tour something. B-Tour forever, with a number four. It's drawn almost like a capital H, but it's a figure four. Rawlings approached the letters and pointed at the first five. See, B-Tour, there's no letter U, he said. Okay, then what's Beetor? Wells asked. Rawlings laughed. The Graffiti King of Tennessee. The entire South, really. It's a guy. Once you finally see Beetor, you'll start recognizing it everywhere. He tagged more shit than you'll ever know. Rawlings put his hands on his hips and admired the decoded message. Wells took a drink of water and shook his head. I like Detour Hotel better. It fits this place. Wells gestured to the mud puddles and trash as he spoke. If I ever heard an appropriate name for this stretch of tracks, then that's it. Vang agreed with a dramatically deep nod. Rawling shot Vang a look and returned his gaze to the wall. Doesn't matter, though. It's about to get blasted right the fuck off there. Rawlings beamed as he walked back to the rally point. Wells shook out his trash bag and picked up a few fast food bags before he was troubled enough to speak. I wonder if it really matters what you call things. Maybe something is what it is despite what you call it. Wells said. Vang silenced his radio and replied. A shithole's a shithole. Rawlings is right. It doesn't matter. Wells took a deep breath and resumed picking up garbage. Vang walked away and found Rawlings crouching near the remains of a large poplar log. The tents of the wicked will be no more. Damn it, Harper. Rawlings stood and smoothed out his shirt. I think I'd like to know what he was thinking. How he made it out here, Vang said. Rawlings leaned down and picked up a hypodermic needle. He had nothing left in the tank. I think it's a pretty logical place to end up if you got nothing left to live for, no matter what direction you're coming from, up or down. He put the needle back into the garbage sack. I wish I'd had a chance to talk to him one last time. 
I hadn't talked to him, you know, like, like really talked to him in almost a year. I didn't even know Polly left him, Fang said. Yeah, I didn't know he'd gotten so bad, so paranoid, I guess. I don't know what I'd do in his position. If we ever lost Lila, I don't think I could keep it together, Vang said. I recall something he'd said back in late February about not being able to dream. Yeah, maybe that's what did him in. Theoretically, I guess, but what if you get robbed of your dreams? What all's left of you? Long sprigs of spring grass waved in the consistent breeze. He examined a bottle cap that was so rusted that it made no sense to collect as a piece of trash. Rawlings straightened his collar and sighed. I'll admit, he started to get on my nerves. But I realized something. We're fortunate as hell, Rawlings said. I try repeatedly to remind myself of that. Vang agreed. I heard in a wealth seminar one time that you're only six bad decisions away from this, from something like the Detour Hotel, Vang said. Rawlings licked his lips and hefted the black garbage bag over his shoulder. I don't know how you got to six. Maybe you got six. I think sometimes it doesn't even take a single bad decision. Sometimes a place like this is where you've always been. It's been waiting for you, Rawlings told him. He leaned down and picked up the soaked remains of a scratch-off ticket. Vang put the hood of his slicker up over his head as a tinkle of cold rain began. Maybe it doesn't have to be your last bad decision that gets you under the bridge, but it could be someone else's. Someone you never even met. Chapter 44 Rin sauntered down the fractured sidewalk of Main Street on her way back from the Thai takeout joint. She waited for the falling chirp of the walk signal, the grumble of the cars passing by on the parallel street, the 23 LED bulbs of the walking man signal, before she stepped across the cross street and headed east. She pulled her jacket around her body and tried not to grit her teeth against the dampness. Ahead there lied the troop of wispy transients that haunted the block between Mapco and her apartment. She recognized all but one of them. There was the guy she called Red, broke-ass Wayne Gretzky, Muddy Waters, Sideshow Barb. She had silly little names for them. A couple of them were friends or acquaintances of Kevin's. Joining them on this late summer afternoon was a Metro police officer. He casually dug his heel into the brown dust below a spindly elm and shot the shit with the gang. Rin watched them as she approached, but ducked her head as the officer turned his gaze to meet her. She took medium-sized steps as she passed. I know you've seen her, broke-ass Wayne Gretzky said to the officer. I don't keep track of everybody I see out here. I ain't got time for that. You'll see. She's got my dog. Rin touched the chain-link fence as she kept a wide berth around the men. I've never seen you with a dog, the officer told him. Broke-ass Wayne Gretzky shook his head. I was holding him for a friend. He skipped town after the guys got shot. I got stuck with the dog. I made a real bond with that mutt. Rin slowed and gripped the chain link fence. The tattered black construction scrim waved in the breeze behind the fence. You're talking about the shooting over here under the bridge? The policeman asked. Gretzky nodded wildly and took a drink from his supersized fountain soda. Rattled my cage, too. I thought about bouncing out of town. I like it here, though. The cops are cool. You're cool. Wren slowly turned to watch the men speak. The sky was smog-free and jet contrails made crisscrossing patterns across the storm clouds on the horizon. <laughs> Thanks, I guess. I was the responding officer to that call, you know, the officer said. Wren lost her appetite. She was instantly out of control of her thoughts, her functions, her emotions. Could you be talking about Kevin? She took four cautious steps toward the officer. Hi, sir. Hi, sir, she said. The officer turned to face her. Can I help you? Gretzky dipped out and took a seat on the bus stop bench. Rin blew out through her nose and took another deep breath. Do you remember a man that used to roll around here? He had long blonde hair, wore basketball shoes, couldn't grow a beard if he tried. It was really funny? She asked the officer. She read his name badge. Wells. I do. Did you ever hear what I just said about the shooting? Rin's cheeks blushed and her vision swam with untold waves of confused panic. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, really. Wells turned an ear to static on his radio. It's fine. What about the guy? You know him? Rin nodded. I, I did. He was my brother. I... Wells narrowed his eyes and crossed his arms. I'm sorry to hear that. My condolences, he told her. Thanks. I've just really been thinking about that night a lot lately? Obviously, obviously I've been thinking about it. 
Wells looked off at the clouds and bit his lip. It was a complicated scene. His radio blasted a series of beeps and jargon. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have bothered you, she turned away from him and said. No, I understand, I understand. I can't talk about it right now, but my shift ends in a half an hour. I could tell you more about it then. To be honest, I wouldn't mind a little decompression about the whole thing. Rin sniffled and wriggled her neck to stand up straight. I'll meet wherever you want. He pulled sunglasses down over his eyes and started walking back to his cruiser. It was parked in the alley next to the gas station. No, it was barely past the front threshold of the building. I'm flexible, but if we're going to meet, I gotta meet somewhere without alcohol. I don't go into places to serve alcohol. Personal reasons. He had a laconic delivery. He seemed tired. How about the juice place on 7th? That's as good as any. After briefly stopping to deliver the sentence, he turned and continued to his vehicle. Forty-five minutes later, in white shirt and active duty slacks, Wells entered Kale Yeah. He spotted Rin and slid into the booth across from her. He cleared his throat and looked around. She closed the styrofoam clamshell of Lad Naw before her and pushed it to the side. The Elvis is good if you're hungry. He sneered and shook his head. I'm good. I'm sorry about your brother. I know it's months later, but I'm sorry. It's one of those... Rin sat up straight and pulled out her notebook. She looked down at the table and spoke. I've come to terms with the fact that by most definitions of the word, Kevin was not innocent. He gave the notebook and pencil a morose look. Nobody's 100% innocent. I try to stay upbeat. I got kids. We're getting right into it with the heavy talk, huh? I'm not good at small talk. I'm sure your kids are wonderful. The vinyl booth quietly protested his squirming. They are. Can I tell you something, though? He looked out the window at the busy thoroughfare. Ren began to write the alphabet in lowercase letters as well, sighed and continued. I don't think I can view this as much else but a confession. You Catholic? Ren shrugged her shoulders. God is far away. It's the best I can explain it. Wells nodded his head and swallowed. That makes sense. I confess about once a month, but it doesn't always break everything loose. Some things are too traumatic. I feel like the fathers don't really listen anyhow. This call with your brother? This is one of my major traumas. We're all under a contract to speak with a therapist on a quarterly basis. It's part of the job. And part of that program is identifying major and minor traumas. Rin motioned for him to continue. I was the responding officer to a shots fired call from the general area of the Detour Hotel. We didn't call it that then, but we've been calling it that recently. I call it that too, she said. He stared out the window at a gathering bank of clouds as he continued. Someone in the Stacks apartment building called it in. No information, just shots fired. I had no idea how to approach the area. I was moving west on Douglas, so I got on the parkway and headed south. I was there in about three minutes. It was windy, cold as hell, really, really cold. As I approached the scene, I saw Harper. He was crawling away. Rin seized her notation of the alphabet with the letter X. She put down her pencil and looked Wells in the eye. Did you know Harper beforehand? Wells chuckled. Yeah, most people in the department knew Harper. I didn't recognize him at first, it was just too dark. Rin felt her heartbeat in her ears. She couldn't breathe. The time she'd wasted. She'd rendered smells, tastes, images of the man's daughter, window frames, sounds, frost on individual blades of grass, and this man, Wells, had the upper hand in pure individual experience. Wells took a deep breath and spoke again. Harper had fallen trying to get through the fence. He was still somewhat coherent when I found him. He saw me and he didn't know who I was. I made a radio call for the ambulance, but I'll be honest with you, I was in a bit of disbelief at what I was seeing. You expect certain things in certain scenarios. Certain people. You know, only in dreams do people that you really know in real life end up in outrageous situations. I dreamt once that my brother was standing on top of the Batman building, the very top, the tip top of one of the spires. And I remember thinking, it can't be him, instead of how could anyone do that. It was more important to establish who was doing it instead of how plausible the event was. Then I thought, my god, he's going to be in so much trouble. 
Dad's gonna whip him. And that's kind of the way it went with Harper. Before I registered how strange it was that he was in the situation, I thought to myself, Polly's gonna be so upset. Or we're under attack or something. These things kept spinning in my mind. They all ended up not being the truth. Rin's fist quivered with the heat of her fevered pencil strokes. She narrowed her eyes. The truth? Wells pulled at his collar. The truth still isn't certain. He told me something. And I guess it was the way that he told me that was the thing. He told me, I got him. I got the killers. And me, in my reflexive state, I asked, Who did they kill? Wren paused her writing and turned to the page of her notebook. Harper looked up at me like I was the only person on earth that didn't know what he was talking about. He said to me, They killed everyone I ever loved. Which just got to me. I told him to stay where he was, called it in for backup, and I drew my weapon to have a look for these men. I didn't know how many there were, what state they were in, nothing. Were you afraid? Rin asked. I was a normal amount of afraid. I couldn't see any movement under the bridge, it was dead quiet. You go into procedural mode in these situations, like you're trained to do. I made my way into the homeless camp and found Gallardo, El Gordo. He was DOA. Shot once in the head and three times in the torso, real rough shape. I didn't find Kevin. He made it to the bushes. I hate to say it, but he spent the night out there. A corporal spotted him at daybreak. We hadn't widened the scene out enough to locate him. Rin again put pencil to paper. Wells rubbed his nose and continued his story. I went back over to Harper and he was almost gone. I asked him what he'd been doing out there. How many were there? I wish he'd been able to answer me, but he wasn't conscious enough. I held his hand, but he didn't have the strength to squeeze back. He seemed somewhat at peace. I'm glad he was at peace. I don't know what to think about the whole thing. I got really freaked out when he let go because it dawned on me there could have been more guys out there. They could have been watching. I guess there could have been more that got away that we don't know about. At that moment, I didn't know what was going on. I felt like I didn't save him and now I was alone out there. I didn't know they'd gone out there off duty. That he was drunk and so forth. My instinct was to trust him. And that's the part that troubles me. I felt exploited. I felt... I don't always feel like I'm in control. Personally, I mean. That's part of the thing with not exposing myself to drinking. So witnessing that act of killing by somebody that I knew Someone like me, seeing someone driven over the edge, their adrenaline at full peak, manic, bloody with crime, seeing that person cathartic and trusting me with their final secrets, it was disturbing. I hate to say it, but it was like a bad dream. A really bad dream. Thirty seconds of silence commenced at the table. Rand eventually put down her pencil and reached across the table to pat his hand, gently yet mechanically. It's a tenuous balance that we have between society and madness. It's always fluctuating, she said. He spun his wedding band as he watched a bus roll by on the street outside. I want to be clear that I think your brother was a victim. He had nothing to do with it. He defended himself. If he wasn't always innocent, he was innocent at the end. Wren withdrew her hand and picked up the pencil. I believe you. He was capable of tenderness. He always gave until he was at a deficit. He gave his last dollar more than once. Rin turned the notebook on its side and continued to scribble. I talked to a lot of these guys out here. It's not easy. But there's more society out here than there is madness. In some ways, there's more society out here than in, for lack of a better term, greater society. How so? In here, in this greater society... We're always distracted. We always got something to do, something to control, something that we should buy. There's so much pressure. Entertainment is so good. Advertising is going on all the time. We're hustling from screen to screen. Outside, it began to gently rain. And in the other society, she asked. Time's a lot slower. Identity's more internal. You need more confidence. That's kind of the way it should be. But that's a hard life. 
It's a brave life. You knew the way Kevin lived, at least. You had to know the odds that these people are up against. Wren made a few final strokes of the pencil and tossed it in her bag. Identity's always internal. But you're not always who you think you are, either. Wren neatly tore the second page from her notebook and pushed it across the table. Wells leaned forward to examine the page. It was a sketch of Wells, hand under chin, looking out the window. His expression was rocky. Five o'clock shadow. Hair hand combed back into a shaky pompadour. Shadows moving back to front across his face. That's you when you're under control. Hold on to it. Wells picked up the portrait and examined it as Wren exited the juice bar and headed east on Main Street. Chapter 45 I honestly don't know how other people perceive how I feel at any given time. I honestly don't know how other people perceive how I feel at any given time. I was 19 when I first used augmented reality. It was so clunky. Androgynous cyan avatars behind smoke glass lenses with pixelated pipes and pumps. I was in a design class at Old Dominion. It's totally amazing how things have changed in the past few years. With the processing power available and the machine learning algorithms that are out there right now, I'm certain in another five years that experienced salons will go the way of porn theaters and phone booths. Remember Blockbuster Video? The sandboxes are a novel little flea circus heralding our soft oblivion. A very personal apocalypse. We aren't dying of dehydration from infinite jest yet, at least. Two years ago, I was working as an experienced architect in Norfolk. It was new and exciting, and I was working 80-hour weeks because I was totally convinced that this is my dream job and this was art. I was on the cutting edge of design or whatever. It wasn't that crazy an idea. There are mechanical lips to kiss while you're in virtual reality that you can buy at big box stores. That's a real thing. I was concealed in an experience session on a weekday afternoon. I was watching a man exhibit cruelty to an NPC in a story. Just these brutal acts of depravity on a helpless virtual model. I was sick to my stomach. I had seen abuse of the system before, but not quite on the level of what Street was doing. I don't know if it was the political environment or a long week or what, but I had seen enough. I entered the experience space and started to interact with the environment. My first thought was to take things away from him or shut it down. That's what we were supposed to do. I was too pissed. I went over and grabbed him by the back of the neck and pulled him away from the NPC. There was this insane croak sound and fuzz and glitches. Immediately the experience collapsed and I was ejected from the space. It made my nose bleed. He got it a lot worse. We tried to get him to the hospital in time, but he was done for. I heard that it was an aneurysm. He died the next morning. I want to say that above anything else, Leo did everything correctly. He fought tooth and nail to set the record straight and settle out of court quickly and quietly. He believed me. He stood up for me. I didn't even know what I'd done, to be honest. No one did. I guess that was how I ended up getting Doyle, too. In a way, Doyle got the last laugh. Leo met with me the morning after Doyle was killed, and I mostly came clean about what I'd been doing. It wasn't pretty. I tuned out as he fired off grievance after grievance. He didn't really mean a lot of what he said, and I forgive him. I really do. He was never short with me aside from that last morning at Sandbox, and I deserved to hear everything he said. After the case was closed, he offered me $250,000 and told me to never come back. I'd made him a lot more than that, but I understood the stakes. I took the money and left. Part of the reason I was under so much stress had to do with Kevin. The rumor was that he was living on the streets in Nashville, and he may or may not have had a drug problem again. My mom didn't really know. She has a million problems of her own. At the time, there was nothing I could do for him but to try to call him and vainly convince him to come to Norfolk or wire him some money. After a month of disconnection, his phone number was eventually reassigned to a woman in Murfreesboro named Tracy. He was off the radar. Over the course of a weekend, I packed up everything I had and left Norfolk. I drove straight through on Monday and found a weekly motel outside of the city to start my search. I drove around for 12 hours a day and walked it for another six. The dogwoods were in bloom and the drivers were courteous. The city always glowed with fleeting heat as night fell, and I'd contemplate what Kevin would be doing at that given moment. My strongest instinct was that he'd left town. My second strongest was that he'd been arrested. 
Nothing online suggested that he was in jail. After 12 days, I started to question whether I could even recognize him when and if I found him. I kept driving because I started to like being in motion. I started to like being in Nashville. Kevin had made a cardboard sign that said, God bless. He was sunburned and thirsty. He was standing on the corner of Charlotte and 25th of all places. I was relieved to find him, but even more relieved to find that he was the same Kevin I always knew, though he had lost a lot of weight. He was still optimistic about his chances. As we drove back to the motel room, he told me, At least on the bottom, you're always looking up. I used Leo's money to pay 18-month leases in full on two adjacent apartments in a new building in what Kevin swore was the coolest neighborhood. I gave him the keys to the one with a better view. I helped him get a job bar backing a few blocks away. My mom even came to visit for Thanksgiving. Kevin was unchained in Nashville. They say people have animal spirits. Kevin was absolutely a wolf. There was an arrow before him beckoning him to run. I've seen him unironically howl at the moon before. He was a slave to the wild frontier. He wasn't built for this day and age. And maybe I'm not either. If Kevin was from the past, then maybe I'm from some future that we can't rationalize yet. A pathetic person relying on the closure I may get from making simulations out of the people that I hate but want to forgive for selfish reasons. That's me in the parking lot after a session with fake Harper, crying my eyes out, wondering what the fuck I'm doing, wondering why the real world is so bright and the sun moves so slowly across the sky. Crying because of a commercial, writing in my notebook, eating fast food. Jesus Christ. Maybe someday the sandboxes will be so good that regular people can have an entire arc experience like Harper's tragedy. Could a person even handle that? Days or weeks of experiences scaled to the right perception? Who wants that? At what point do we begin to change as people by participating in things like that? When does real life become unbearable or false? Could an architect change someone with an experience so pervasive? As an architect, or a former architect at least, I've been changed by it. I've been through hundreds of these people's lifetimes, and I'm not sure of the way through mine. What deity would condone this burden? I get mixed up constantly. Hopeless says that the ultimate horror of desire is to be fulfilled. If that's the case, then the ultimate horror of faith is proof. Some people need faith. What did I gain by testing Harper's faith? From testing anyone's faith, real or not. Whether it seemed to be with good intentions or otherwise, I gained nothing. That was Harper's lesson for me. Adding what you believe to others subtracts from them and sometimes it subtracts from you as well. Other times it can subtract from someone else and unintentionally add to you. I learned a lot about purpose and fate from what Harper allegedly believed. I learned that I kind of liked what I believed. I kind of liked myself even. I never knew I had it in me. I used to want to share the outstanding beauty that I'd seen in simulations the intense catharsis and mind-altering joy that one could receive from a really good experience. I wanted to share it with everyone. I saw people who didn't enjoy experiencing and I faulted them for it. They were fucking it up, wasting experiences on dumb things like climbing Machu Picchu, which you could actually go do in real life, or choosing something way too intense for who they were. If they only knew what their own minds could do in this simulation space. No. Incorrect. I'm incorrectly framing this. They got exactly what they needed out of it. The counterintuitive lesson was that some people do things that they know they won't like just to enjoy things that they already enjoy more extensively. They do this by enjoying the dislike of something opposite. They come away satisfied in their boundaries. Even though I know it's a valid way to be, I hate it. I'm imperfect and so are they. I can't change that. Hopeless was right about the whole thing as usual. I needed to have an experience of my own. It made me realize that I was lucky, lucky to be alive and aware. I was lucky that I hadn't been prosecuted in Norfolk and I could still reasonably get a job doing experiences somewhere else. I didn't have to make Harper the main character in my personal experiences. I started from a place of pure hatred for him. I could have just scrapped it and spent time with Digital Kevin. But something that Hopeless said one night made me reconsider. She said, Harper is more like you than you like to admit. You both lost essentially the same person. You both took someone else's life. 
but you're the only one that gets the chance to recognize that and do something about it. Her statement triggered a deja vu that transcended the environment. I felt as though many dimensions got thin, almost as if, if I looked up, I could see all the way to heaven. I felt as though someone were above me, guiding me, showing me the way. Not the way, maybe, but a way. I know that Harper died there with Kevin under the bridge that night, but I also know that I have the power to change how I felt about it. I have the chance to do the right thing and move on. I'm not them, but I'm still me. I don't have much time to write anything else. I spent all morning writing this up, and I should go now. Notebook number 99, pages 3 through 16, if you're following along. I'm walking down the street. It's Saturday afternoon, September 28th. I'm walking into an experience salon in Lachlan Springs. I just took off my jacket and swallowed the vitamin. I'm going to have to put away my notebook soon. I wanted to tell my story before my experience today. I felt terrible guilt for a long time. A little bit for Doyle. A lot for Kevin. More than I thought I would for Harper. I hope that the final sequence to Harper's story will make sense. Chapter 46 The bronze cowbell hanging from the doorframe gave three petty clunks as Rin stepped inside the lobby of Magic Eye. What's up, girl? You wrapping up Detour Hotel today? Andy asked. Rin took off her jacket and hung it on the rack. She sighed as she resumed scribbling in a notebook. I am. Andy stood and walked around the desk. Hey, seriously, I want to say this is one of the most elaborate external submissions we've ever had. I watched almost all of it. It's good. It's weird, but it's good. Ron said he might make you an offer for it. It's kind of uh, Inception-esque and he likes it. He wants to hire you. I don't sell my stories, thanks, though, Rin told him. She tucked her notebook in her pocket. He handed her the vitamin and a glass of water. Andy itched his nose as he waited for her to finish. You used to sell experiences, why not now? She handed the glass back to him. I don't know what people want to see. I don't really know what I want to see. Maybe machine learning is almost there and it'll show us what we need to see. It would save us a lot of time. Making experiences is draining for myself or... It doesn't matter. It takes a lot of psychic energy. Ren opened the door to Salon 1 and Andy followed her into the room. I don't like the machine learning betas. They're too obvious. See, I guess for me, user subs sort of feel forbidden. There are a lot of personal details. It's different than sandboxes. You know just as well as I do that some of the sims are totally boring. Well, maybe they're boring to you or me, but people like them and that's okay too. Please don't keep a copy of my submission. Rin scribbled one last line of text in her moleskin and placed the notebook in her bag. She kicked off her shoes and climbed into the chair. You sure you want me to delete it? You have a copy of it, right? I hope it doesn't freak you out that I'm watching it. Andy spun the cranial semisphere into place and adjusted the leg restraints for her as she settled in. Her feet were beginning to get heavy. She looked around the room and answered him. I don't care if you watch my experiences. I used to watch other people's experiences all the time. Andy lowered the lights and helped her adjust the arm straps. I only watch the external submissions. If I have to watch another moon landing, I'm going to scream. Rain grimaced and relaxed. God, the moon landing one. 1202 master alarm. Her grimace slowly melted into a smile. You know what? Keep my story. No one will watch it. There aren't any pirates or dinosaurs or sharknados. It'll be hidden in plain sight. Label it as an indie experience, you'll be guaranteed that it's a secret. Andy laughed. I think the part I like the best is the discussion you have with him in the bar. He tells this whole story about how he met this woman or something, and Andy's voice was fading into the background. Rin's pupils dilated, and she felt that flexible sensation in her neck, as if her head were coming loose, climbing high into a violet light, her body minty tingly with the pinpricks of dissociation. Chapter 47 Shortly after midnight on March 7th, 2017, Rin was sitting against the red brick facade of Sandbox with her hands folded around her knees. She pulled her coat down hard across her chest. The wind screamed against the north side of the building. Icy mud quivered in the gutter below. She powdered her glossy red lips and toyed with a handful of her weavy black hair. 
She frowned at it and closed her eyes as the hair faded back to her naturally dull and straight auburn. The last two inches of one lock bore the faint aquamarine glow of an abandoned summer look. She let it trickle from her fingers as she heard the swoosh of an approaching car. Here he was. The howling wind assisted the careen of Harper's Falcon sedan into the parking lot. It pulled to a crazy stop halfway between two parking spaces. She ran over and pulled open the car door. What did you do? she asked. He was holding his side, pale with blood loss and breathing with a sad wheeze. His pants were black and sticky. I'm cut shot. Take me in. Take me to care, Anne. Rin grabbed him by his collar and leaned back to yank him out of the car. She nearly fell backward, hoisting him to his feet. She let him go, and he took off toward the door as fast as he could shamble. She reached in and stopped the car. She pocketed the keys and ran over to open the door of Sandbox for him. Sad flecks of snow began to whip through the air. I got myself into some trouble, but I got the guys. I got them. She closed the door behind them and locked it. He took three steps before wavering and leaning against the hallway wall. She pushed him forward. He took steps at a 45-degree angle. A wild drag of dried blood left a fuchsia streak on the wall. What did you do to them? Wren asked. We had a shootout, but I got away. I laid both of them down. Gary Ann's killers. Wren propped him up against the wall and walked over to the desk. He sure did. She took one of the orange vitamins out of the cabinet and placed it in his palm. She wiped her hands across her face and took a deep breath. Harper gulped the pill down and gasped as he tried to catch his breath. The guy that did it? Wren began. The guy that did it? What was he like? Wren asked. He stared at the ceiling and thought. He was a monster. Living under the bridge with other monsters. Wren grabbed him by the shoulders and steered him into room number two. He sounds like he was a sad person, she said. She kicked the door closed with her heel. Don't feel bad for him and his people, Harper said. He plopped down into the chair. She put his arms in the restraints. His breath rattled. She torqued the semi-sphere down over his head and booted the experience menu. He was staring at her desperately. She loaded a sandbox as fast as she could. Harper flexed his bloody hands open and closed. Don't feel bad for me either. She abruptly stopped typing. She began to feel an unexpected lucidity boil to the surface of her hasty dream performance. This wasn't like the other experiences. The isolation was distinct. She stopped typing and looked at Harper. Outside the night was missing people. The roar of the wind was gone. It was just the two of them in the entire world. No. It was just her. She looked back at Harper. He was waiting for her to speak. She had been silent when other people's ghosts had breathed down her neck so many times before. She leaned over and asked Harper a question. What if I told you that it wasn't the men under the bridge that were monsters? That I was actually the monster? Harper shook his head and coughed. You're not a monster. She turned her head to the side and thought. I've always felt an empathy for the monsters. The killers. The real horror isn't that of the victim. It's in discovering that one has become the monster. Realizing what it's like to be the monster. The burden of the victim ends when the victim's killed. But the burden of the monster is greater. It continues. Harper was growing ashen. Drops of blood dripped from his fingers to the floor of the salon. The monster's only afraid of itself, Wren continued. The monster requires a subject to occupy its energy. It can't bear its own cruelty. You're not a monster. You're an angel, he told her. She pivoted the monitor away and leaned in to speak to him. An angel's just another type of monster. A mercy monster. Wren reached out to the keyboard and hit the inner key. Harper tried to speak but could not. He heard sounds like that of a decelerating jet engine as he woke to the experience that Wren had created for him. Forward slow, forward slow, left, together, the dance instructor said. Harper took crooked steps as he came to his senses. Wren was before him. 
bright aquamarine streak in her hair now glowing as bright as the flow from an artesian spring. She was holding his outstretched left hand. His other hand was firmly placed on her left shoulder. Forward, slow, forward, slow, left, together, the instructor repeated. They were among dozens of smiling people on a summer evening, learning the foxtrot under a large pavilion. Spectators were munching snow cones and pointing at fireflies as dusk settled on Centennial Park. Rin closed her eyes and with the flash of static she portrayed Kara Ann. Harper came to life as he recognized his daughter, a high school sophomore, heart beating unquestionably for dance, hand in hand with him as they strode across the busy dance floor. Corner step, are you ready? she asked him. Corner step, the dance instructor yelled. Leave with your left hand, she told him. He took her hand in the crook of his forefinger and thumb. Forward, slow, forward, slow, left, together. She was wearing that little silver ring that Polly's sister had given her for Christmas. They were bumping into people and Kara Ann's cheeks flushed with embarrassment. Roy wasn't exactly getting the hang of it. You're taking too big a steps, she told him. Here, just tap your toes forward, straighten up your back. Everybody's swaying, let's sway, sway. She led him side to side and kicked his feet into position. Harper breathed the evening air and let out an earnest laugh. She was helping him get by, and he saw her bite her cheek the way that she would when she was having a good time. Kara Ann pulled him all the way across the full dance floor as people performed swing moves, cha-chas, and rumbas all together to big band brass in the summer twilight. Harper gripped his daughter's hand and imagined her as an adult, on stage giving lessons to the joyful throngs. He imagined her as a person observing from the grassy lawn. He imagined her as the old woman carefully taking steps with her husband of 40 years on their lovely planet in the corner of the pavilion. He imagined himself as the fireflies in the bushes. He imagined himself as himself, dancing with his daughter in her youth, pulling the cords of the future in another more delicate direction. Corner step, corner step. Sway, sway, Kara Ann says. You're getting the hang of it, she told him. He looked up from his feet and into her green eyes, flecked with brown, reflecting the rustic electric bulb lights strung around the edges of the pavilion. Roy could smell sparklers as the trombones took a solo. Forward, slow, forward, slow, left, together. Forward, slow, forward, slow. They remained in motion for song after song, finally coming to a stop after the victorious swell of a French waltz that Harper did not recognize. Harper let Kara Ann go and turned sanguine circles to take in the scene. Tears filled his eyes as he watched people of all ages mingle in an impossible hive of wholesome joy. They spun about him in a terrific blend of fabric and energy as another song began. He was swept up in their motion. He put his left hand out and danced with everyone at once, forward, forward, left together, turning in the corners, performing as the crowd had, smiling and laughing to the music. Kara Ann watched him from the periphery, blushing at the audacious sweetness of her father's joy, his silly fervor. A man named Joe Daniels is standing in the southeast corner. He has a tripod set up and he's filming the entire event on one of the first commercially available models of Nikon 4K cameras. Two days later, he'll upload the 56-minute video to YouTube and set the privacy to public. Wren will send him a simple message that says, Thank you. The band completed another song, and applause exploded throughout the crowd. Out of breath, Roy folded his hands together and formulated a prayer. Wren, as Kara Ann, stepped forward and took his hands in hers. The entirety of the crowd stopped to watch as Harper closed his eyes and spoke. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of family in this wonderful evening. May we remain calm in irksome situations, and may we be rewarded with your grace. We are so very fortunate to know your blessings, Lord. May we earn the right to be seated beside you in the kingdom of heaven, all of us together, forever and ever. Amen. A final note. Bitor was the nom de plume of Ronald Ronnie Bobel, who died on December 26, 2016, a couple of weeks shy of his 30th birthday. Bobel was a prolific graffiti artist who worked with the UH and ICR crews. According to his obituary, he was happiest when he was painting with his friends. Much of his work can still be found throughout the South. Additional music used in this episode, of course, is Padam Padam.
by Edith Piaf. Detour Hotel is written, recorded, and produced by me, Aaron Rogge, in rainy Nashville, Tennessee. Additional music by Lee Rosevere, Air Glow, and Soft and Furious, licensed under Creative Commons 3.0. This work is adapted from a novel of the same name, by the same person, and is a work of fiction. Any resemblance to real people or occurrences is a coincidence. Paperback and Kindle versions of Detour Hotel are available on Amazon. Thanks for listening.